start, you just want to hit your microphone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Calling the meeting <clears throat> to order at 9.05 of the Committee of the RTA Organizational Services and Performance Monitoring Committee. Okay, I'll go ahead. Can I have a roll call, please? Okay. Mayor Biasiata? Here. Ms. Moss? Here. Ms. Duarte? Here. And Mayor Weiss? Here. We have four committee members present. Outstanding. <clears throat> This evening, we have um, three items on the agenda. Uh, we'll go through each individually, but uh, to summarize, uh, item first item is for the purchase of a new locomotive work car. Second item is for our micro transit program, a pilot program. And the third item is for a new easy fare mobile ticketing system. Uh, we'll go in uh, a little more detail on ERT. On each. Uh, so first up, we have a procurement request for three million two hundred ninety-one thousand two hundred four dollars and eighty cents with uh, Geismer North America LLC for the purchase of a new locomotive work car. And I believe we have uh, Mr. Manning here, correct? Here. And Mr. Hale. Uh, that are going to give us a little background information on what this request is. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning, Mayor. B Excuse me. Good morning, uh, Mayor Biasiati, members of committee members and uh, members of the board. Um, Mr. Hale, just if you would just speak into your microphone. And uh, is that better? Yes. All right. So my name is Aaron Hill, and I am here to present on the uh, locomotive work car. So here is our current locomotive work car. Um, and here is a, a picture of uh, a service that was being had in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, where, the, where the trucks and the traction motors uh, were being serviced uh, for the first time. Um, so our locomotive is our, our workhorse machine, and we use it for a lot of hauling of our heavy materials and equipment. Uh, and these pictures um, in the top left, uh, we are hauling uh, new railroad ties. Um, over to the right is uh, the train car uh, that we use in emergency situations. And then uh, below that at the bottom is our ballast car, uh, which we fill up with the rocks that support the track structure. Um, and then again, again, like I said, this is for us to, we use the locomotive to haul around all of our uh, larger and heavier equipment. So uh, it was built, the locomotive was built um, in 1943 and RTA purchased it refurbished in 1978. And the most recent repairs um, are in 2010, there was a major engine overhaul. So this locomotive has two engines, um, one on either side of the cab. In 2012, uh, the traction motors were rebuilt for the second time. And then the most recent is the rebuilt air compressor. So right now, the, the wheels on the locomotive are beginning, uh, the wheels are beginning to experience a thin flange, and uh, they are beyond the capacity to be repaired. Um, a lot of the parts, because this machine is so outdated, they are becoming uh, obsolete, and the electrical system is beginning to be, become hazardous. Um, the wires are beginning to dry, dry rot and fray uh, throughout the, the structure of the uh, cab and the locomotive. Um, beneath the cab, it is uh, beginning to rust out, and there is uh, cramp seating that is uh, only available for two operators. So here is the locomotive interior, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you can see some of the controls are a little bit old and antiquated, um, and you can see some of the, the rust on the interior of the cab. And uh, right beneath the cab is where it's beginning to rust a little bit uh, more severely. Um, so in this picture is showing just some of the structure 
Again, that is right beneath the cab area where the operators sit. So the, the new proposed design um, offers a little bit better field of view with a double-ended cab. So as it is right now with our current locomotive, uh, the center cab um, offers, uh, the, the field of view is a little bit difficult to see sometimes. Uh, when you're looking out the window, you may have the extra 30 feet in front of you on either direction uh, as you're traveling. But with the new proposed design, uh, the end cabs offer a better field of view uh, going either in either direction. Um, also, with this new design, uh, as you can see, there is a flat deck in the middle, which again helps with transporting the material. So as opposed to having uh, two or rather three pieces of equipment, um, now we can use this one car to uh, help us with our work duties. So on one end is the cab crane. And again, this cab, uh, this crane helps us with lifting some of the larger materials, um, being rail and frogs. And in the past, what we would do is we would have our locomotive carrying the equipment. Uh, we'd also have a, a flat car, which you've seen in the other pictures, um, carrying the materials. And then we have a crane or some type of other equipment to offload those materials. So with, with this new work car, it'll allow us to have uh, one piece of equipment out uh, versus those three pieces of equipment that would do the same thing. So some of the project benefits is that uh, the newer work car, the, the, the engines meet the EPA tier four diesel standard. Um, the multi-use vehicle with the crane and the flat deck, flat deck uh, makes the new locomotive more versatile, as I, I just explained with uh, before using three pieces of work equipment versus the one. Um, the newer, the new design is more narrow uh, than the existing uh, locomotive. And the main cabin has seating for five crew members uh, plus the operator. And again, the improved field of view uh, with the double-ended cab helps out tremendously. Good morning, Mayor Biasiata, committee members and members of the board. My name is Glenville Manning. I'm the contract administrator for this procurement. Um, the RFP was issued July 19th, 2021. 29 interested parties downloaded the package. Three vendors submitted a proposal. The evaluation for this RFP included product design and performance, proposals, reputation and performance, pricing, cost proposal. The evaluation panel members consisted of rail department power and way, engineering and project development, procurement, and office of management and budget. The recommended vendor is Geismer North America Incorporated. They're located in Beaufort, South Carolina. A 0% DB goal was established for this procurement. Current and past clients include the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, New Jersey Transit, Port Authority Trans Hudson, and Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. The anticipated delivery of the locomotive work car to be completed within 25 months of contract signature and notice to proceed. Staff requests that the Organizational Services and Performance Monitoring Committee recommend an award to Geismer North America Incorporated for the locomotive work car in an amount not to exceed $3,291,204.80. Questions? Any questions from the committee members? Aaron, large yours. Yes, um, so I think this is a really um, great vehicle. Um, and I understand the purpose, and I guess I didn't realize that um, I think we only have one. So my question is, is how do we go from light rail to heavy rail? How does that, how are we able to move it? So our, our current locomotive uh, can go through both light rail and heavy rail. Uh, and again, with this uh, newer locomotive, it is a lot more narrow. So it will help uh, just throughout the whole system uh, for us getting through and around uh, throughout the whole system. $3,291,204.80. Uh, 
through the chair. Um, oh, sorry. Mayor, please. please. Just a quick question on the, on, on the cost. I'm assuming, was this budgeted for, for this year or is this kind of uh, accelerated because of the condition of our existing uh, locomotive? Mayor, it is budgeted for this year. I'm sorry? It's budgeted for this year. It's budgeted for this year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Joyce? Uh, through the chair, when, when we say pr proposed design, so are, are these all locomotive work cars aren't the same? They're, they're kind of building to our specs? Is that what I'm led to believe? Yes, they are building to our specs. Um, okay. The rail department came up with a different design and criteria that needs to be met by all proposers, and they submitted their proposal with what we asked for. Great. Thank you. Any further questions? Great. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve this procurement request on three million two hundred ninety-one thousand two hundred four and eighty cents with Giesmer North America LLC for the purchase of one locomotive work car. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Moving on to our second uh, procurement request of the morning. It's for our micro transit program. It's a pilot program in the last six to 18 months. Our partners in this procurement program are the village of Mayfield, city of Highland Heights, and I think it's share mobility. Is that correct? Share mobility. And we're going to have a pres uh, presentation today. And um, Ms. Feck, the floor is yours. Thank you. Trying to get the right presentation up. OK, this is the other one. OK, okay there we go. Thank you. My name is Mary Beth Feek. I'm the director of planning at RTA. And I'm it's a great pleasure to present to you GCRTA's Micro Pilot Mobility Program, RTA Connect Works. This program is, represents RTA's first venture into the world of microtransit. Our plan is centered around workforce development. It's trying to bridge the mobility divide, it connects communities, and create partnerships. First, I want to define the region that the issues that face our region and our service area. Let's start with our customers. This is from our onboard survey, which was done a while ago, but you can see that our, the folks that use the system are transit dependent, and most, the primary trip is the work commute. In our region, this is our county. You can see the job centers here defined, um, and this is where the, the wealth of manufacturing jobs are within our region. This shows you not only where the jobs are, but where the income forces and the income um, is within the county. You can see the green, and then there's a lot of jobs there. The next one is that small map shows you our system. The blue lines are the bus routes, the next-gen routes, and then the other lines are our rail lines. You can see RTA gets you there. We get you to that. Um, however, people without cars live in areas that um, have fewer amenities and um, frequent service. Their jobs are located outside in the areas. You can see they're at the ends of our lines. And many of those jobs require a trip, a first last mile that is not always pleasant. It's going down industrial parks. And it's not easily navigated, especially in the wintertime or early or late at night. There's a growing demand for those essential workers in those areas. The next gen um, service change created a whole new network that gets people to jobs much quicker, much more efficient. However, there's a lot of room in that service network to create first last mile options for others. And workforce community, workforce transportation initiatives within our communities are growing and we're trying, and RT is working with those. So in order to look at this system, microtransit is not new to the transit in industry. There are many agencies across the country and across our state that are doing it. So what we did at RTA is we formed a team, and our team is based on service management. Joel Froelich was on our team looking at the service. Nick Davidson, the 
director of paratransit. This, is, this service is much like that. He helped us. Dawn Tiger from our legal department. This is a new system. This is a pilot. She was essential in helping us craft something that met our union's needs. Again, Scott Ferraro, George Fields helped us create an MOU with our union on this. Felicia Brooks-Williams helped us with the ADA and the Title VI issues. And then Jose Feliciano and I were the two people that went out and talked to everyone we could. We researched microtransit. We talked to agency providers and shared mobility providers. We looked at how best we can meet the needs of RTA and our region. We also facilitated partnerships. Dr. Caver and Ms. Birdsong were on a webinar last year with, that was created by Greater Cleveland Partnership, the Fund for Economic Future, Ohio Means Jobs. We also dealt with industrial groups of the Arizona, the Solon Chamber of Commerce, and WireNet, talking about the problem and how we could best resolve the issue in a transportation framework. So what we came up with was Connect Works. It's a short-term pilot program, less than 18 months. It's helpful for first last mile. This is first last mile. This does not represent the, any new service. We are not duplicating any RTA services. We are working with our system and with that next gen that we've done. We have to pick up an RTA facility. That is a transit center, a rail station, a bus stop. And it has to be within Cuyahoga County, our service network. Our service network, it is flexible. It can be whatever you want it to be. The budget is $600,000. That's the funding we had. And RTA is coming up with 50% of whatever that cost is. And again, I told you it's no longer than 18 months. So what an applicant had to do is create a team, a team to provide the service, to design the service. Remember, this is a unique service. No other service is like this. It is flexible. It allows communities to develop their own transportation routes based on their needs and the needs of their workers. And it works with existing services of RTA. Um, it, we did not take out any service or adding service here. The applicant had to design it, supply the vehicles, the operators, schedule it as needed, and it'll meet all of our requirements and FTA requirements, insurance, regulatory compliance. All the people that I mentioned to you had a hand in this. And again, we pay half. So RTA, we provided technical route assistance. We already did that in, as we evaluated some of that, and we will continue. We outreached. We outreached to, we had 71 people on the webinar, and our outreach was to all those people and all those networks that I've just described. We're providing up to $600,000. $400,000 was an ODOT competitive OTP2 funds, and $200,000 is our own. And after we run this for six to 18 months, we will evaluate the success. That success will be based on ridership, on use, on employer feedback, our, our customers, as well as did it get people to jobs? Was there less of an employment issue in your, in your industry? We've got two great teammates talking about creating partnerships and initiatives within the community. The village of Mayfield and Highland Heights came together, and their team included the two villages and Standard Parking Plus. And I know that Sean will go into greater detail about the, who they are and what they're doing, but basically they're asking for about 120,000 from us. They are matching it with city funds um, and they will connect to the 7A7 route. It'll navigate through an area that has 12,000 jobs and we have solid written letters of support of all those industries. This is what the route looks like as of, that's how they've, um, defined it right now, and you can see all of the places that it's going to be and all those huge companies that it will employ and use, and they are all supporting this. Share Mobility, again, our second team. Share Mobility will includes Share, which is a TNC, Solon, Bedford Heights, Cuyahoga County, and the Fund for Economic Future. They have a flexible route. You can see the areas that they plan to serve. They're going to start with the Southgate Transit Center, which is a great place at the southwest east end of our service area that also has other transit agencies feeding it. They plan to serve the areas of Solon and Bedford with 24-7 service. And it will connect to the 19, the 40, the 41, and the 90. Um, 
Again, Southgate is really in the heart of the area. You can see the darker um, are lower income, and, and so you can see it really does fit well. And it also does um, link up to the other part that comes in there, and eventually Akron wants to come in there. So it'll be a nice modal center. So I, I'm showing you this map again because I'm telling you with these two proposals, we hit about a third of the county in the job areas. And we're hoping that as we grow this and this is successful, we'll be able to soon put circles and squares around the rest of those areas. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Sean Becker. Thanks, Mary Beth. Good morning, Mayor Biasiata, committee members and members of the board. My name is Sean Becker. I'm a program contract manager in the procurement office responsible for this procurement. The RFP was issued on September 13th, 2021. It was accessed on the GCRTA website by 78 interested parties. Proposals were due on December 10th and four firms proposed. The evaluation panel members consisted of representatives from our Office of OEO, ADA and DEI, External Affairs, Paratransit, Service Management, Programming and Planning, Legal, and Procurement. Proposals were graded on the following evaluation criteria. The partnership, general plan and project approach, the proposer's operating plan, and the budget. So the first recommended firm is Mayfield Village in Highland Heights, and they will service the Mayfield area job hub. They will be utilizing Standard Parking Plus as their transportation provider. And SP Plus is a professional parking management and ground transportation provider with over 23,000 employees across North America. They have a commitment to innovation and technology. There's a strong municipality partnership uh, with employer buy-in. Uh, this area you know, has Progressive Insurance as the major employer. They also have Mayfran International Inc., Mars Electric, and Omni Systems, among others. The second firm, Share Mobility. They are based out of Dublin, Ohio, and Columbus. And they will be servicing based off of the Southgate Transit Center, as Mary Beth mentioned. And they are a leading provider in mobility as a service solutions. They have a track work record working with private employers to create commuter programs for employees. And they have experience working with local transit authorities and governments, including Chillicothe Transit, CODA, City of Dublin, and Cuyahoga Community, Cuyahoga Community College. <clears throat> so the staff recommendation Staff requests that the Organizational Services and Performance Monitoring Committee recommend to the Board of Trustees awards to mic <clears throat> for microtransit program services to the Village of Mayfield and the City of Highland Heights in a total contract amount not to exceed $119,197.50 to Av Auto Media Inc. doing business as Share Mobility in a total contract amount not to exceed $300,000, resulting in a combined total amount not to exceed $419,197.50. Questions from my committee? And, oh, and also, oh, I'm sorry. At, at this point, uh, I'm going to have Mary Beth introduce one of our uh, representatives from the village of, May oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> village of Mayfield. Do you want to come up, John? This is John Marquardt. He's the finance director of the village of Mayfield. <laughs> Mayfield Village. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board and committee, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is John Marquardt. Uh, small correction, I'm the economic development manager. Uh, no problem. Uh, it happens all the time. But uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any specific questions you may have. Thanks, John. Thank you. Board members? Mayor Weiss? I'll start. I have, I have all, all kinds of questions, probably more than we can cover this morning, but let me start by just saying how excited um, I am, and I, I suspect I'm speaking for the entire board, just about um, the excitement about um, this, this proposed pilot. Um, it's a key um, kind of missing link um, that, that we're filling, and so um, hats off to the team for uh, to, to, uh, devising the, the program. I guess I would just start with the beginning of how does how how is it actually scheduled at the that last mile? I mean, are there regular routes? Or is it 
by uh, request? How, how exactly does that work and how many days? I mean, is this during the work week only and, and so forth? So Mary Beth can probably parlay off of me, but um, the one service with Mayfield, it's a continuous route that'll be approximately between seven or 6.20 in the morning till 6.40 p.m. And that's uh, in line with the routes that service that area um, over at the Mayfield uh, Job Hub. And that'll be uh, weekdays. And then Share Mobility, they have an app that actually riders will uh, schedule their service and they can schedule repetitive routes as well. Um, but that's a 24 seven uh, service and it'll be based off scheduled routes. So two different kinds of uh, flavors to it, but uh, all mm -hmm. servicing those specific areas, so. Great, thank you. I'll let others ask, come back in, in line. I don't have a question per se, but I do have a comment. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, I appreciate the, the kudos of Mayor Weiss and, and the questions. I think that we all have uh, plenty of both. And I'm really excited uh, for the staff and for the, the community members as well to really enjoy a different way of thinking about mobility. Uh, when I first got here, this was a, a, a grave discussion about where do we go with first last mile. And the operations team, I'll say specifically Doc Caver, as well as Joel Freilich and, and Mary Beth through planning, really kind of stepped up and said, hey, let's think about ways that we can be different and uh, put a little brain power to it along with a lot of others as indicated in the beginning of the presentation. And uh, we scout our own budget. Uh, we look through some of the um, uh, additional funding that we had around the edges, so to speak, uh, and looked within executive budget and looked in other places to be able to cobble together the 200,000. And then, of course, we were able to um, add additional funds through OTP and uh, just really be able to make this a robust program. Um, 600,000 is small when you think about the benefit that it can bring to the community, but it's a good, solid first project and a good, solid first pilot. And I look forward to being able to uh, increase uh, the kind of traction that it gets in the community. And I think this also gets to uh, getting people to put their money where their mouth is. So if we have a known issue with transit in our community, we need to be able to support it through funding and support it through our acumen. And I think the best way we can do that is to be able to have pilots like this. So I appreciate the support. Mr. Chair? Yes, recognize. Ms. McGall. Thank you. Um, I just want to chime in and echo in that um, <clears throat> following uh, Mayor Weiss, that I think this is a great program. Um, we've been talking about last mile for decades and decades in the overall transportation industry here in particularly for the last decade in, um, as well. And I think it's a great program. <clears throat> I think it would be good for us to connect this to our next gen project um, because even though it's it's a pilot program. It's still part of our overall transportation um, mechanism. So I think that as, as we can fold that as part of next gen, because it still is next gen, even though it's a pilot, I think that that would behoove us so we have one continuous program. Um, personally, I want to say hi to John. It's good to see you. Um, keeping up the good work out there in the community. Um, but again, it's a, it's a great program. Um, I think there's some connectivity, um, India, to seeing how this may connect to some of the stuff we know that NOACA is working on, um, to see how we can leverage some of the funding we're spending to take this and cover some of those other areas in the future. But overall, um, it's one of those things, if we don't try, then we'll never know. So this is a good step into the area of at least we're trying. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Floor is yours. So it, it, will there be the fare will be the same as RTA or is this uh, or is this going to be a free service? On these two programs, there will be no fare for additional fare. It'll be taken care of. Mayor. Sorry, I forgot the mic. Um, if I saw the slides correctly, it looks like we're investing, of the 600,000 that we've allocated to the program, these two pilot programs will take about two thirds or 400,000 roughly of it? About 420. Okay. And I know you'd said, I think the, the, the pilots were up to 18 months. So is the 600,000 intended to cover the current year or is that intended to cover up to 18 months of each of the programs, just walk me through. So, so we will not exceed the $119,000 for the village of Mayfield and Highland Heights and $300,000 for share mobility. So should we get to the point where we start hitting those funds and not hit the term of the 18 months, uh, we would 
evaluate accordingly, but uh, we wouldn't proceed without the standard procurement uh, process as far as GM change order authority, as well as uh, I'm sure Mary Beth will be keeping the board up to date on how the success of the uh, these solutions are going. So. so are the terms of each program different or are they the same? No, it's the same term, but um, I think when they start, when they finish, the number of people using it is what's going to be um, the expense driver. So as they um, use the funds, that'll be it. We, we really have left it open. We've got 120 or whatever left. We can either change order one of these contracts, or we're also looking for more funds to do additional programs, as uh, Ms. Birdsong mentioned. So we could also roll it up to another program that we um, put out another time. So we've got a couple of options. We want to keep it open. And for us, it's good to have that little bit of cushion. Okay. Sean and Mary Beth, when you guys speak, you can just pull the mic a little closer. Any further comments from the, our board? Great. Um, I echo the comments we heard from the board. I think this is a important step to address a need that's been there for a while. I think it's very uh, creative and many things in government today problems are solved with partnerships and i love to see that we're partnering with the communities and this is absolutely a, a core responsibility of ours to connect people to jobs uh, and i wish this pilot program all the success uh, without further ado i'll ask for a motion to approve a hundred nineteen not amount not to exceed one hundred nineteen thousand one hundred ninety seven fifty for a contract with the village of Mayfield and the city of Highland Heights, and for an amount not to exceed three hundred thousand with share mobility um, for our micro transit program. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion to move to the full board has been approved. Thank you. We're going to move on to our third agenda item this uh, morning. And it's also another thing that's a kind of a core thing. We are uh, embracing technology. And this agreement is for a new ticketing system with the Easy Fair mobile ticketing. And we're going to work with the Northeast Ohio Ride Council governments for its deployment. So we're going to um, move on right now. We're going to have a presentation from um, Mr. Lively. Good morning, Mayor, members of the, uh, the committee and the board. My name is Michael Lively. I'm a director with our IT and ITS department. I've had the honor to come before the board a couple times to talk about our fair collection system. We've spoken about it at our ad hoc technology committees, as well as as the January committee, we provided an update on the future of the fair collection system and what we'd be testing and then proposing later this year. And so this is that update. So in the ITS department, in 20, at the end of 2019, we developed a five-year strategic plan uh, built around four pillars that face the customer, those being maintenance, service delivery, customer experience, and safety. As we talk about fair collection, it mixes two of them being service delivery and the overall customer experience. Our strategic plan was based off the RTA strategic plan adopted by the board with uh, major components of how customers pay and improving that. Uh, the, the system we'll talk about today hits two key, p key components, one being um, the fair equity and implementing a more equitable system for our riders, as well as the advanced technology of account-based system, open architecture, and ultimately the goal of fair capping. So before we talk about the future state of our fair collection system, we won't talk about our current state. So this, was a, this is a recap from our last presentation, but we have four main components of our fair collection system today. That is the fare box, the ticket vending machine, the customer service kiosk, and our current mobile payment app. The TVMs and the CSKs are ATM style machines that you'll see at the stations. The current mobile payment app is through Passport, and that uh, contract is set to expire this year. And the number one means of collecting fares at RTA for the last 10 plus years has been the fare box. 
So going from left to right, you see the, the current Odyssey fare box. This was installed in 2007 across our fleet and all of our buses and trains. Uh, they're no longer on the red line trains, but they are on the rest of the vehicles. Our ticket venue machines and customer, uh, customer service kiosks are located at Tower City and other stations. And then on the far right is the current mobile payment app through Passport. Now we'll transition to the future state of fare collection at RTA. As mentioned, when we presented in January, we have a short-term and a long-term plan for our fare collection system. If we were to install or replace everything in our system today as it stands in our system today, it'd be anywhere between 15 and $19 million. So in order to enhance our fare collection system, provide extra benefits to the customer, but not make that capital investment initially, we have a short-term and a long-term plan. The short-term plan is to ultimately replace the mobile payment app. That is a contract that is expiring, and so we have to replace it. Uh, but we, in doing so, we want to provide extra benefits to the customer. So we're going to install ticket validators on our vehicles. The ticket validator that Dr. Caver has here is the validator that you will see. It allows um, passengers to board, a con a scan contactlessly, and validate their fare when boarding the vehicle. We're going to keep the current fare boxes. We have an internal department here, electronic repair, that is dedicated to rebuilding those fare boxes. We have um, numerous spare fare boxes. We rebuild the major components in-house, and so we can maintain those fare boxes being the number one means of fare collection for years. We'll begin to in incorporate fare capping and smart cards towards the end of this project, and then ultimately it will create a regional fare system. Our neighboring transit agencies, Parta, Akron, Lake Tran, and uh, Sorda, or Sarda, all have the same system that we do. So everyone in the region will have the same technology on their vehicles, making it very easy to transfer from transit agency to transit agency. Now, while implementing the short-term plan, that's when we're beginning to look at the long-term plan, is looking at the adoption rate of the new technology, ridership throughout RTA, and then determining what is it that we want to um, do on a long-term fare uh, collection system. Do we want to buy new fare boxes? Do we want to buy new TVM CSKs? If we do, do we want to buy less? So looking at that, um, that system as a whole. So in or before we... As we started the short-term plan, one of the things we want to do is start a proof of concept. So a proof of concept allowed us to essentially test the technology and ensure that it was going to work in our, at RTA and throughout our region. And so we started a proof of concept. It was a small purchase of $28,000 uh, with Masabi and through NeoRide, but allowed us to go through all of the training to test the software, test the validators, and go through and start testing to ensure that it would function within our system. And so we're in the process of doing that now. It also allowed us to essentially streamline the, the project. So as we look at, we're looking at two different deployments. On the, the, the left, you have the proof of concept, and on the right, you have the full deployment, which we're requesting action from the board today. On the initial deployment, this is going to be, as we roll it out um, for the soft launch this May, this will be the visual validation on our vehicles. So this will be similar to our current uh, mobile payment app where you board the vehicle and you're showing the operator an active QR code that indicates you have uh, paid and activated your fare. On our new Healthline vehicles, the new Healthline vehicles will have these validators on them so passengers can use the validator. And then the rest of the fleet will be speed of visual validation. Uh, through action of the board, we'll be looking to deploy the remainder of the project. So the remainder of the project would be purchasing two, uh, one to two validators for each fixed route vehicle, uh, two to three validators for our rail vehicles, integration with our other software systems. So the systems that you see uh, within when you board a vehicle that the operator is using, integrating that software as well as at Tower City. Uh, purchasing of smart cards for our passengers. So we want we will purchase those cards up front. So if a passenger would like a smart card, we, they, we will provide that free of charge. And then we get into the account base and fare capping, working with our retailers, and then also our universities and employers through the partner portal. So when we talk about the current scope of the overall project uh, that we're, we're seeking approval for today, these are the major components. The mobile ticketing is obviously the big piece on the far left. That's working with real-time uh, applications as well as the EasyFair app. And then you can see the web portal, partner portal, and the hub back office. Those are the back-end software systems that we uh, manage in the IT, ITS department. We have the, the retailers. So how the retailers work is uh, passengers can go to retailers and load funding onto their mobile app 
and or smart card. Uh, they could load that through credit card or they can load it through cash. And so if a, a rider has $10 cash, they can go to a retailer, trade, uh, essentially uh, take that cash and load it onto their smart card or mobile device so that it's always recapped within their uh, system. The JRVs, as you see on Dr. Caver's desk, that will be installed in our vehicles. And then ultimately the far right is creating that seamless system for our riders throughout the region. So our current mobile app, we were going to initially with our passport app, the contract extend, uh, ended in May. We were going to um, transition right away, but in reviewing that, we noticed that there are about 19,000 unused passes within that app. And we have no way to confirm are those current riders, riders that no longer use RTA, but we did not want to just shut down the system with all those unused passes. And so working with the current vendor, we've extended that contract through the end of the year. And so what that allows us to do is any passenger that currently has a, uh, a, a fare within the app, they have to the end of the year to use that. And so um, starting in June, we'll change the app configuration so you can no longer purchase new passes. You'll have to purchase it in the new payment app, but you can still have through the end of the year to utilize your fare. So the proof of concept. So this is the initial launch, and then you have the full approval. So the proof of concept plan, we've already worked through the majority of it. Uh, we've got, recently gone through all of our training, so we're starting to uh, manage the system today. We have a user testing app, so we have a full app that we're using internally here to test the configuration of this, the system. We want to ensure that it's fully operational and pass our audit before allowing it the customers to use it. And then we're going to begin the installation of the initial validators on our Healthline vehicles. In the full deployment, uh, we're seeking board approval today in April. Uh, we'll continue with the training and marketing outreach, the soft launch in May. So soft launch means the system is a fully functional system. Um, if you're a passenger, you can use it, but we're not fully announcing it to every passenger to make the transition because it allows us to essentially test the system, ensure that it's function operational, and then all of our back uh, office procedures here at RTA are you know, in line. And then we'll begin um, as we deploy the validators on the remainder of the vehicles, begin working with the retail outlets, and at the end of the year, sunset the Passport app. Total project budget is about $2.7 million. The, the majority of that is the validators. So each validator, we're buying over 800 validators to equip our entire fleet, multiple validators per vehicle. Software integration to integrate with our current systems that we have already. And then the smart cards, buying two different types of smart cards for our passengers. One is a credit card style, where if it's a long, you're a long-term rider, you'd have a you know a harder card and more durable that you would use. And then you have more of the paper style, traditional fare card um, that you may throw away if you're just in Cleveland for a short time, but still want to use the smart card benefits. And then the last piece is the revenue sharing. So all of the, the revenue that we see through the app and through the system as a whole, um, the vendor gets a, a percentage of that. And so when looking at our current mobile app and the new mobile app with all the credit card fees, it's very comparable in the percentages. So total project budget, $2.7 million. And I'll turn it over to Sean and procurement. Thanks, Mike. Morning, Mayor Biasiata. Committee members and members of the board, I'm Sean Becker, Program Contract Manager with Office Procurement, and I was responsible for this procurement. Uh, so this is an interagency agreement uh, through NeoRide, which uh, GCRTA is a member, and through Ohio Revised Code Section 306.43H4, provides that competitive bidding is not required when an expenditure is made from another political subdivision, public agency, public transit system, regional transit authority, the state or the federal government, or as a beneficiary under a state or federal procurement contract, or as a participant in a Department of Administrative Services contract under B of Section 125.04 of the Revised Code. So currently, easy fair agreement between NeoRide and Masabi. Uh, GCRT is a member of NeoRide, um, and this contract is set to expire March 2023. They are currently in negotiations uh, to establish a new, new terms for this agreement. So this procurement includes equipment and services to participate until that new agreement is executed, at which point we will go, management will go back to the Board of Trustees uh, to get on the new contract as well to continue services. 
So a proposal was received on January 6, 2022, based off of the NeoRide agreement uh, with Misabi. Proposal was reviewed and discussed by representatives from accounting, executive, finance, innovation and technology, intelligent transportation systems, procurement, and revenue. So the Neoride Council of Governments. So GCRTA ma maintains a membership. Um, this was approved by the Board of Trustees under Resolution 2019-99. There are 14 agencies currently uh, members across Ohio, Michigan, Kentucky, and this consortium is called Easy Fair. Uh, the interlining agencies are Lake Tran, Sarda, Parda, Medina County, and Akron Metro. So Masabi's experience, they launched the first ever UK mobile ticketing application with Chiltern Railways in 2007. Um, in the US, they launched the first ever deployment in 2012 uh, with their fare payment as a service platform, Just Ride. Uh, they have experience with over 140 agencies in nine countries, and they have 70 mobility as a service deployments to date. Additional experience with Masabi uh, in transit, they have Lake Tran, Sarda, Parda, Medina County, Akron Metro, MTA, Boston MBTA, Los Angeles Metrolink, Southern Nevada's RTC, Colorado RTD, and many others. Staff requests that the Organizational Services and Performance Monitoring Committee recommend an award to Misabi to provide easy, fair mobile ticketing solution services in amount not to exceed $2.7 million. And at this time, time will in, entertain any questions. Questions from our committee? Board? Mayor? Can you just walk me through one more time? The, um, I, I lost you a little bit uh, in the negotiation of the contract. So does, does Masabi have a contract with Neoride with today? Neoride. And, yeah, and, so and, imagine um, like a state contract, for example, they establish yeah. it, it has a term. So we're kind of hopping on towards that back end of the term, um, the last year of it. Um, so we're getting all the equipment and services uh, established to get to that expiration, at which point when the new con con contract is established, we'll come back to the board for that authority to join on to the new term, which will likely be a five-year uh, term. So that's why we're only getting to March of 2023 because that current expiration, uh, we're, we're hopping on at that back end. And we're comfortable that that Masabi will enter into a, a new contract with, yeah. with NeoRI? Yeah, they're they're in discussions as, as we speak. So we've had, we've had a couple of meetings with Masabi and NeoRI. Okay, and then do we customize for on based on that kind of base contract? Is that is that how, or is it one size kind of fits all for everybody in Neo Ride? For the system, it's it's an open source, so the all the transit authorities we have our custom fares and our policies and the way that the app will work. But functionally, it's all the same for every transit authority, which makes it easy for training and maintaining the system. Thank you. Just a quick comment, if I may, Chair. Uh, this is really a way to start to simplify the system a bit. Uh, we've got uh, several, um, if I can say, even competing systems within how we uh, charge our fare and collect revenue as well. Um, we're really looking forward to taking a regional approach to be able to simplify the use for the customer and also uh, expand how folks um, are able to use their current technology even in their personal lives to kind of expand over into the RTA. Um, so this is the first of, of many that will come before you within the next, dare I say, year or two from ITS and IT to be able to address the fair collection issue. Again, this is uh, almost, if you think about it, like the first last mile. It's something we've talked about for quite a while and are now starting to make headway uh, as an agency to catch up with the rest of the world in the IT realm. Um, there's a short list or a long list of companies and agencies, uh, sister agencies that utilize this kind of technology. Um, I just came from RTD, they were on that list, and uh, you can see the difference in payment. Uh, so it will be nice to be able to join those ranks. Any further comments? Mayor? Yes, um, well, I should have started out by saying, I, I, I think again, again, it goes without saying how excited I think we all are to see a, a new up, a upgraded system. So uh, again, um, kudos for, for that. The, the validators, can, can you talk to me about, uh, talk to us a little bit about how that would, how those actually work? And, and you had mentioned multiple validators per vehicle. Is that because of 
volume it comes on, or are we talking about front end, back end? How, how does that um, it, it intended to work? Yes, yeah, so great question. So the validator itself, it's a PoE validator, which means it's just powered by a traditional Ethernet cord. Uh, we'll install them on multi multiple areas of the vehicle. So the main, every vehicle will have it at the front um, on the lower stanchion. So as you board, it's ADA compliant um, on a horizontal um, form. And the rider would use, use their mobile phone or smart card, scan it, and it gives a notification to the operator, both visually and audibly, audible, to let them know active or not active, or if they need to show some type of form of identification. Installing them on multiple areas of the vehicle, so for example, on the Healthline vehicles, we're going to install two, one at the front, one at the, the mid-door, which also has a wheelchair ramp and will be ADA compliant, so that when boarding vehicles, you can board on multiple doors. So uh, rail vehicles, given the length of them, will have multiple as well. And so that's how the system ultimately works. There's no money being transmitted on the vehicle itself. It's basically just verifying that I have an active fare and that I've already paid my fare off board when boarding the vehicle. Great, thank you. Further comments? Great. Then I'll ask for a motion uh, to move to the full board, the procurement request with Masabi or amount not to exceed 2.7 million for the easy fare mobile ticketing and scalable fare payment solution. Motion to bring to the board. Second. Second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion to move to the full board has been approved. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, I ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting now at 9.56 a.m. Moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to carry. Uh, RTA Organizational Services and Performance Monitoring Committee is, is now adjourned. Thank you. Uh, before, we, before we go to our next committee meeting, let me make an announcement. Uh, you will notice that we are... We've had a change in chairmanships, and uh, that's because the bylaws are provided that after a chairperson or chairlady has been in office for three years, it changes. And so this morning, you will see two of those committees have, have made a change, and the third one will make a change after the conclusion of this meeting. We want to thank Mayor for accepting the chairmanship of this committee, and you did very well on your first time out, and uh, we wish you well with your committee. Uh, thank you very much, and we can now proceed. All right, Ms. Duarte uh, is uh, virtual, so she'll start the next meeting. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I call the RTA Organization Health Services and Performance Monitoring Committee to order at a.m. Teresa, roll call, please. Ms. Duarte? Yes. Ms. Moss? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. And Ms. Payo? Here. Thank you, All right. We have four committee members present. Thank you, Teresa. We have one item on the agenda today. We will be covering the Warren Stove and Aiken station area. Please informational update includes two upcoming construction projects currently in design. The platform station and more station improvement and the track reconstruction from Parkway to the station. We have three presenters today. Joseph Schaefer, Matt Murata, and Chris Popet. Gentlemen, feel free to Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Ms. Duarte, Chair and committee members and board members. Um, very excited to be here today with you to present this project with myself. My name is uh, Matthew Murata. I'm a resident architect here, and uh, Mr. Chris Kopic is behind me. He'll be presenting also. He's our track um, manager, engineer. Um, so here is an overall 
a bird's eye view of the Van Aken district um, with the new implementation of the proposed uh, comfort station, train station reconfiguration in the context of the district. A brief uh, project history. Um, the pur purpose of this project is to, re to rehabilitate the station and enhance the Van Aken district development. Uh, the design is primarily being completed by RTA staff, and then we also have a number of consultants on board with us, um, assisting with the engineering and survey and uh, safety and security. Um, we've also had a, a great experience working with the city of Shaker this past couple years. It's been a lengthy process um, to look at you know, how we can improve the site within the context of the Van Aken district and build upon that and uh, leverage that with um, RTA's uh, new uh, station. Um, briefly, to look at the you know, Van Aken district development and you know, leveraging the development that, the, the, excuse me, the development that's taken place over the last couple years. Um, Van Aken district developers working with the city of Shaker had completed a $91 million mixed use development. Uh, there's approximately 75,000 square feet of new retail, 65,000 square feet of new office, and 103 uh, apartments. Uh, the city is also um, getting ready to, you know, the phase two working with the developer, uh, the multi-million dollar um, new apartment complex on Farnsley, which will have house about 228 new apartments. And then just east of our um, RTA uh, site, there is a future phase three for a p potential uh, future office uh, building. Uh, here's a look at the existing conditions. Uh, you can see the uh, large uh, orange rectangle in the kind of the middle of the screen. That was the previous RTA uh, substation and cover station that, that existed. Um, it was demolished a few years ago to make way for the Van Aken district development and to implement the new Tuttle Road. So, the, you know, the major uh, underlying goal of this project is to replace that uh, facility for RTA. Um, where the green rectangle up in the upper um, top, that is the new substation. Uh, the substation is currently installed on site. We're just waiting to uh, get the connection um, working with the CI. And also, um, this is a major um, bus rail transfer point. Uh, we have uh, existing RTA uh, busway there with multiple uh, bus stops. So looking at that and implementing, you know, how we look at this project and fitting that into the Van Aken district and the city of Shaker, um, really trying to leverage that to create a nice um, project for RTA and our RTA customers in the community. A uh, brief overview of the phase one. Uh, we'll re replace the RTA cover station. Uh, we'll also install the CI uh, pad mount and equipment cabinet uh, fence screening. We've gone through a lengthy process working with the city on the planning department and how we um, meet the needs of that. We'll go over that a little bit later. Um, also construction of a new ADA uh, compliant three car platform. And then we'll also demolish the e existing eastbound platform track and our existing storage track and some associated uh, catenary structures in order to make way for the uh, phase one construction of our platform and comfort station. Um, also, we're, we, we're paying close attention to um, security and lighting throughout the site. It's integrated into the design and we wanna increase the traffic and pedestrian safety, ADA access and mobility, promote cycling. And as I mentioned earlier, we really want to increase the activity and pulse within the Van Aken district development, um, enhance the walkability and connectivity, and create an experience, experiential architecture. Here's a look of the overall site plan. Um, you could see on the right, is going up and down the page, is uh, Tuttle Road, and then we also have our existing uh, busway. So the conversation is located at the intersection of the busway and Tuttle Road. So it's an um, integrated uh, location. And we have our CEI equipment, the new train station platform. And then we have two platform entries within this design. Um, the existing station only has one. So by having these two entry points at the furthest end of the platform, it creates the, enhances the 
um, transfer point for the bus to rail and rail the bus. And then we'll also be replacing our storage track and installing a new double crossover. And Chris will go over that a little bit later. Um, here's a bird's eye view at the corner of the busway in Tuttle, looking up north towards uh, Van Aken District. Here's a look at Tuttle you know, for the entrance into the train station platform and then also the comfort station to your left. Uh, there's a lot of glass on the comfort station. Um, security and you know having the visual experience through the space is very important. Um, and then also the RTA uh, signage and logo um, fits in to the context of the development and then really trying to build upon the identity of RTA and creating a, a welcoming place for our RTA customers that feel safe and welcoming is key to the project. Here's an early, another look at the bus, looking at the busway down the busway. Um, you can see the, the large, you can see the canopy overhang on the conversation that provides not just aesthetics, the primary guiding principle was that is to provide shelter from rain and snow and the elements and sun. Here's a look at the train station platform. Uh, here's the mini high ramp for uh, ADA uh, boarding and also a look back at the conversation. Uh, one thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's a concrete ramp all the yeah. way. Good. Thank you so yes. much. No problem. Uh, here's a look at the along the busway, uh, the CI um, reclosures and disconnect switches. Um, this is a screening um, that's along those uh, boxes. The reason for the screening is to meet the zoning code re requirements for the city of Shaker. We've went through an extended uh, process working with the city of Shaker planning department and ABR and how do we best treat this without becoming an eyesore. And then also um, the guiding design principle was how do you maintain the visual, um, how do you see through the fence, the screening in order to see the bus and the train, whether you're on the pl train platform or on the busway, and then also for safety and security to, to maintain that visual um, look, through the, look through the screening. And then also how do we create a, enhance the architecture and the walkability experience for our customers. And then with the landscaping, it also kind of softens it up too. Here's a look at our proposed uh, bus shelter on the busway. And we're working closely with the city also and in, internally with RTA. Um, this is kind of the prototype um, shelter that we're looking at. It's kind of um, builds, up, builds upon the conversation design and the architecture. Uh, crime prevention through environmental design is also, as I mentioned earlier, is a very key point of this project. We have multiple cameras throughout the, the site and emergency call boxes to cover every angle and, and view to make people feel uh, welcome and safe. Proposed uh, materials, here's a look at um, some of the materials, the garbage cans and the benches. A landscape plan, as you've seen in the renderings, um, just looking at native species and salt tolerant um, plants that, that will hold up to um, you know, the, the icing salts that we put down in the winter time. Um, also work very closely with the city of Shaker on that to you know, build upon the um, enhancing the Van Aken district development. Uh, project schedule, we just received, RTA just received the uh, ABR final design approval on March 21st. Uh, we're working extensively on uh, construction documents now to hopefully advertise in uh, July and construction notice of proceeding in October and then approximately one year of construction. Um, the existing train station will be open during construction. We've spent a lot of time and looked at that extensively. How do we maintain service during construction? Uh, the train service will be operational on the westbound track. 
and then also maintaining uh, temporary busway service uh, just adjacent to the existing busway. We're working uh, currently with the city of Shaker and how to implement that. And our construction estimate is uh, between three and three point five million dollars. We're evaluating that further as we get closer to um, finishing the design and construction based on the current uh, market. I will turn it over to Mr. Kopic now. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, so as a project overview for phase two, this will be the uh, portion of the job where we do a lot of the track work, signal work, overhead. Um, the project will begin with demolishing the remaining uh, platform and the existing track. The project will include a complete replacement of track, everything east of Farnsley Road. So we'll have new sub ballast, ballast, new rail, uh, new, a new double crossover, um, and a new turnout and maintenance track. And then along with this new track alignment to, uh, as Matt mentioned, um, flow more smoothly with the alignment of the busway, uh, we have new track alignment and the new double crossover. This new al alignment allows us to get a little further east of Farnsley Road uh, to get out of any you know, snow impacts, uh, salt, sand, any debris that might come in from the roadway to help kind of reduce maintenance over time. Uh, with the new track bed, ballast, sub ballast, we will have new under drains uh, to help improve the drainage of the site and to uh, help eliminate any foul ballast um, or surface issues with the track structure. A new overhead catenary system with the new alignment will have new uh, foundations, new catenary poles, a new uh, overhead um, catenary system, and then new signal system upgrades. Just kind of an existing view of what's out there uh, today. Um, as you can see, aerial, aerially, we have a lot of uh, OCS wires out there that are no longer in use. This was back when uh, this, this area was more of a yard at the end of the line. So we'll be able to clean up kind of the sight lines, um, get rid of some old feeder cables and some old OCS. And then obviously on the uh, right, we've got um, kind of some interesting track geometry out there today from, from transitioning uh, from the old yard. So we'll be able to kind of streamline the operations into and out of the uh, new station. Picture on the left shows the current end of line and you can kind of see on the track there some additional vegetation and growth and, and some foul ballast. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and eliminate with the new station and the new under drain is, is get the water off the site as quickly as possible. And then on the right hand side, we have the existing crossing with our new track alignment and the new double crossover. We'll be able to move this uh, double crossover further to the east, as I mentioned, and that will clean up this uh, at grade crossing on the western end of the project limits, uh, and getting it out of the middle of the double crossover, which will make it much more uh, pedestrian friendly and tie into the new development um, and make it you know, much more walkable for, for passengers today. Here's just an overview of the uh, track geometry and, and the proposed uh, alignment. Um, just kind of a more, like I say, more streamlined approach into entering and exiting the station uh, from, an, from a rail operations perspective. And also from an overhead catenary, it helps to simplify uh, what's out there. It helps simplify what, you know, the operations that are out there now and, and clean up the skyline. For project schedule, uh, we're currently working on the project plans and specifications. It will be ready for advertisement for bid September of 2022. Um, looking to award the project uh, at the end of this year. And then the project uh, will be substantially complete July of 2024. The uh, reason for kind of a, such a long schedule is just the um, special track work with the double crossover and the turnout, the lead times that are uh, necessary to get that material procured and, and installed. Um, buses will replace train service during this portion of construction, and the existing busway uh, and bus operations will remain open during construction. Uh, the current construction estimate is five to 5.5 5 million, and we do have uh, 4.3 that's been awarded through the ODOT track grants uh, at this time. And with that, we'll open it up to any questions. Oh, yeah. Okay, Roberta, you can't see me. Um, this is Karen. Yeah. 
Um, I have a number of questions, so I was kind of hesitating to see. So anyone who wants to interrupt me and raise their hand, go ahead and I'll yield the floor. Um, so I, thanks, it was a great presentation and the uh, project looks beautiful. Um, I, I guess, I, and, and this is, you know, I, some of you know that I've been wanting this presentation because it's been in the media and it's been in, um, Shaker Heights Council has had and obviously knew this was going on for at least six months before it's been ever brought to the board. So that, that just gives me pause. So uh, um, since we're doing this as a major project, I see the total project being in between eight and nine million dollars that, you know, this is something the board is very interested in. And I, and I think this is a no action. This is just our introduction to this project. Is that right? This is not for the board yet. Okay, so um, I guess um, one of my, I, just by comparison, when we've done other station repair or replacement, what is what has been the cost? And I guess my my concern is, is this seems like a very high end, very beautiful project that I wish we could have everywhere, and that the bus stations are going to you know be of a different grade than we put other places. And I'm worried about the visuals of this going on in, uh, in an elite suburb that, that we're going to be spending all this money there as opposed to what we do in other places. And you know, I'm all for partnering, but I, I don't see a part, and we've been talking about partnering, I, I don't see any part of this project being financed by Shaker. Um. My comment, just in general, is just to you know build upon the context in the area, and we want to create a welcoming place for our, our customers. And I, under, I understand what you're um, what you're saying there. Um, I, I, Karen, maybe I can sure, help please. my guys out. Um, yeah, this is Mike Shipper. Um, yeah. When you add the two together, it's more than what we would normally be spending. I think one of the things, um, if we were doing a normal station project, the amount of the track work would be significantly less. Um, it happened that last year, through our advocacy efforts, we were able to change the state requirements for track funding, which is the TRAC pot of money. and the money we received, the $4.3 million, was part of an overall $70 million program to replace all the tracks on the light rail system. And we have eight projects in that program. Track decided to fund this project as opposed to a multi-year funding that we requested. So when they decided to do the funding, they decided to place the money. This is our th third project of eight in that program. Uh, Chris will be coming to the board with one of the other projects that's entirely funded through FTA. Um, but And we're going back to track this year to fund the overall program. Um, and we are working with them on, on that. So, yeah, this would be probably closer to a $4 million project by just uh, rehabilitating the tracks along the platform, uh, which would be our normal course of action. Um, some of the work that we're doing, um, as Matt mentioned with the, with the, um, the bus shelters, we have a separate $2 million project funded through NOACA to upgrade shelters on light rail profile, uh, light rail platforms on both the blue and green line. And there's going to be some consistency between what was shown on the, I don't know, Matt, maybe you can go to the rendering but that'll be consistent with the shelter type that's going on in that other project. I, correct, Matt? That is correct. So, I guess but, I'm only noting that when I yeah. go walk around my neighborhood in the city, my, my shelters don't look like that. <laughs> yes. And I, 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 and, and I think we have to be cognizant of that because I also noticed in some materials that have sent to me is that the blue and the green lines together about 3% of our fares. Sure. So, you know, when we're talking about proportional, like where where do the people who use these and where we're spending our money, um, it makes me 
it makes me a little uncomfortable. Okay. That, that concludes my comment. I think my point is made and for, take it for what it's worth. Uh, to the chair, Ms. Duarte, I believe Luce, who was virtual, also has a question. Sounds good, Luce. Yeah, thank, thank you. And I thank you for the presentation. And I'd like to also thank Karen for her question because that's a great question. And I hope we do put that in consideration because, uh, as she said, you know, other locations uh, don't look like this. <laughs> so hopefully this will be a benchmark for future locations. Um, so my secondary question was, uh, Karen took my first one. Uh, I don't see a lot of signage here in terms of direction and stuff like eastbound, westbound. Is that something that um, I trust we're, we will have? Yes. Uh, we will have that. Um, we'll match our typical prototype that we use throughout our system at other light rail stations. And the signage will follow our RTA uh, standard uh, signage. Okay. Uh, I look at it maybe with a different view. Uh, we are building a new facility here, and we then will be building other places as we move along. And I think this sets a a, uh, a benchmark for where we want to go uh, rather than, uh, I know I've had some problems with some of the shelters. In fact, uh, one of my nurses just moved and uh, one of the questions was uh, of the shelter that she would be standing in, she has to leave at five o'clock in the morning. And I was gonna bring that up a little bit later, not with this project, with others, but I like the idea where we're doing this and that means that as we move along to other shelters in the city, as we build, we're going to be we're going upward rather than back the other way. So I'm all I, about that, Reverend. As long as that's if we're saying this is the new standard, so I don't know how much this bus shelter costs, but is there a commitment from management saying going forward this is the new standard? And I understand this is going along with this particular project. Um, and I, I appreciate that it, the aesthetics of it is good for that, and in a different neighborhood, the aesthetics not. But are we, how much does this bus? How does how much does this belt bus shelter cost? And in the future, is that our new standard? And are we going to spend that much on each? And are we do we even have the money to do that? A yes, and yay yes, that's what we're doing. We, I know as far as I'm concerned. As head of this board, I want us to come. We're moving up with the weather going back the other way. So we're talking about a standard, and I think this fits with the project, and uh, I would like to see the board approve it when it comes up. And this is a standard for us to move to. I think uh, you would agree with that? If I can hop into the conversation. So I think these are really good questions about equity and also the uh, concern about future materials for sites like this. I think this is a really good opportunity to delve into what it could look like. And this is really just kind of stepping it up to, to our, our chair's point, but also making sure that going forward, we make sure that we can sustain this kind of effort at other stations so that we don't have a disparity issue. Um, I would suggest that we use today as the discussion, which was the intent to be able to say this. So I appreciate the questions. I think they're absolutely valid. And what we'll do is, uh, I think, even looking at a review of the materials um, it, that we have on deck for other projects for installation and just doing a quick cursory review to make sure that we can maintain that kind of standard would be important before we move to next steps to ensure that we don't have any equity questions. Um, but ideally, we would love to be able to get to a standard that's a little elevated from what we've got, but we got to make sure that we can maintain it uh, for future stations as well. Ms. Duarte, there's a question from Ms. McCall. Um, it's not a question. I just want to jump in on this discussion just because it's the hot topic of the moment. Um, I think this is actually very gorgeous. I think it's a great um, station. Um, I think it fits into the context of the investment that's been made at Van Aken. Um, a lot of, um, you know, I remember when the whole Van Aken district had been talked about 
and years of investment and really pulling it together and then to see what's there now. So I think it's just um, it's great to be able to go there and see it and touch it in the middle of a core urban area. I mean, sometimes we think of Shaker as the suburb that it is, and we neglect the fact that it's in a core urban area. That stated, I want to come back to what um, we heard two of our colleagues say, um, <clears throat> because this has been raised before, and I want us to use um, words of not trying, and I, I'm glad, um, Reverend Lucas, that you said this will be the standard moving forward. <clears throat> I think it behooves RTA to make this the standard, um, because as we talk about equity and inclusion, bus stops, believe it or not, is always that thorn in the side. Um, Karen raises a, a issue that it's always a conversation. When we're in a community and we're doing development projects, normally the conversation is if you want better bus stops, then that community has to either, whether it's that city or that CDC, has to come up with the funding to leverage those better bus stops. <clears throat> so... And it hasn't been consistent in the past, right? So when we did the Clifton BRT, you know, somebody had to come up with the money for those nicer bus stops. Or when we did, um, if you go across, just across 105, and you get to the part over in the UCI area, well, UCI could afford to help make their bus stops look similar to the bus stops along the Euclid Corridor project, but you come across 93rd, those are just regular bus stops. But you go across um, 71st Street, well, you got two cute little bus stops that um, were cute at the time that they were put in because Burton Bell Car helped to make those nicer, but there's no maintenance. The point is, you know, we have brown bus stops, we got, you know, different kind of bus stops, we just got all kind of bus stops along the city. Some are, you know, we just have to get to a standard that we set the bar on what those bus stops are, and they are consistent throughout the city. Because ultimately, that's what the riders see, and when they see differences like that, they see in inequity, and they see inequality. And they see disparity. And they see the haves and the have-nots. And I don't think that's what we're saying we're doing. And I think that's what I believe my colleague is trying to say. So I think this is a great conversation that we're having today. This should be the standard. I'm loving the project. I'm loving the design. I think it's phenomenal. I think, you know, with kudos, because we're talking about the Van Aken district, a district that had been talked about for a long time, took a long time to get that project up and going, and to see all of the work coming to fruition is phenomenal. So we got to celebrate that moment, right? And it would be a disservice for us to put anything less in there to complement what's going on at that, at that corner, at that intersection, and in that area. It gives us an opportunity, as we heard our chair say today, to make sure that now we're taking this as a model and as a standard moving forward. So I just wanted to reiterate it just a little bit more and put a pin right behind it because the conversation is an important one. And it's one of those low-hanging fruit things that if we can just get that little thing right, um, and Shipper probably has heard this so many times. He's been in a community at the meetings when people have been fussing about this stuff. This is one of those little bitty things that I think if we can actually put a pin in and get it a little bit closer to, to where we're bringing that to the table, that's phenomenal. And I do want to compliment something that Shipper said. Getting funding for rail was not ever considered on the track. That was like, I don't know, that, was, that took... Let's just pause and celebrate that moment. Let's just put it there. So as we're talking about going through repairing our rail and getting rail cars and all that other kind of stuff, let's celebrate that this particular project did get track funding, one of the first ones that never happened before in the state of Ohio. And so we have to balance all these differences of scales. But even in that, let's not neglect the fact that the point that Karen is making is an important point, but that this is a great project and it should serve as something moving forward that we just make part of our standard moving forward. All right? Thanks. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I got, I'm not presiding. Uh, uh, Roberta? I just want to say thank you um, to everyone for the great presentation and to my shipper for his leadership, um, as well for the comments uh, of the board and the committee members. Um, I agree, this is a great opportunity. I discussed this with Mike uh, before the presentation. This is a prototype um, and 
we're going to keep learning from it. And the most, uh, I think, powerful thing is also the collaboration that we're having with the district and with other um, just partners. So I, I look forward to continue this conversation uh, with our executive team, with India, like she mentioned. Uh, you know, this is an equity um, topic, right, and initiative. So I'm, I'm really looking forward. And if there are no further questions or comments, um, and there's no motions to be approved today, um, I'll go ahead and conclude today's FDA Organizational Service and Performance Monitoring Committee presentation at 10.30 a.m. That's it. Thank you. Do we need a motion to adjourn, Teresa? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, Ms. Duarte, your committee has adjourned. Thank you. Once again, that is a new committee chairperson, and thank you very much for uh, your first time uh, uh, for making your presentation, and we thank the people who presented as well. All right? Thank you. Dr. McCall? All right. Good morning. I'd like to call the RTA External and Stakeholder Relations and Advocacy Committee meeting to order, please, Teresa. Ms. McCall? Here. Ms. Moss? Mayor Biasiata? Here. Ms. Duarte? Here. Mayor Kumar is not here. Ms. Pao? Here. We have five committee members present. Um, thank you. Um, uh, one of the things that came up um, during our last meeting, and um, quite honestly, during all of our meetings where we have public comment, is around the bus routes um, as part of our next gen. Um, changes that we made, particularly in the Ward 1 area, dealing with the 48 and I believe the number 15 route. And at the last meeting, I, um, Mr. Chair, asked if we could um, try to work to put this to, to rest once and for all as much as we can, um, given that we won't satisfy everyone, but at least let's make um, a, a, a stronger effort to at least show what had been done by the team here at RTA, the efforts made to address um, what we keep hearing from the community as a concern, um, give respect to the, the community um, who, obviously, this is important to them because they've been coming to every one of our meetings um, and expressing their concerns and talking about it as a community. And then, two, to give credit to the staff um, so that it doesn't keep appearing as if they haven't done anything or they haven't gone out there or they haven't listened and they haven't reevaluated the situation. Um, since that meeting, um, Mr. Chair, to the um, board, to the community, um, I had a follow-up meeting with um, um, DGM uh, Natoya Walker-Miner, Joe Froelich and his team um, to deep dive um, um, Mr. Cavers, um, DGM Cavers, to, to further make sure that I understood what had been done and the efforts that they had taken to address this. I asked some questions myself on a deeper dive um, in preparation for this morning's committee um, hearing. And so as a result of that, um, we asked to have this on the committee today. This is actually my last time chairing this particular committee. I was supposed to rotate off, but of course, since I asked for this, they're like, you're going to chair this one. Um, and, and I think it's appropriate, though, um, that we do sort of round out with this. So we wanted to bring this back to the committee. Um, we feel that if this warrants any more discussion, then we can have one more discussion on this. I can, know we have one more board meeting coming up. But we asked the team to present to the board so we can see what had been done. Um, the fact to show that, you know, sometimes we get this in a three-minute comment section and we don't get to respond. And I really wanted us to understand, I wanted to understand what had been done, had we responded, how did we respond, what's the history on some of this stuff, because we get little snippets of it. And in all honesty, to at least try to rest assured, while we, I don't think it may or may not satisfy everyone, but at least give us some assurance that our team did listen they did try to address it as best as they could at the time, and that they will keep it on the forefront, um, recognizing that we actually change routes more than once a year. We call it new gen, and it's not the end of the day with the route changes, but it gives us a chance to maybe look back at this later and say, hey, we may have another tweak here, and we may have another tweak there, but at least acknowledge what had been done. So with that, um, 
um, um, CEO Bursong, I don't know if you want to make some introductory remarks and DGM uh, Walker Minor before we turn it over for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that, uh, Ms. McCall. I do agree with you that um, perception is reality. And so it's really important that we're able to um, explain from the vantage point of the, the service quality folks in operations is on behalf of RTA, the efforts that have gone into the communication with the community. Um, because when we do say we want input, we mean that. Um, so I will go ahead and stop talking, but I'll hand it over to Natoya if you have any additional commentary, as I know this ward is particularly close to you. Uh, you have personal experience in there, I believe, growing up as well as just a, uh, a member of the team. Sure. Uh, thank you. I, I did grow up in Ward 1, and I did grow up uh, writing the 48A. And so this conversation uh, was really a personal conversation in my professional capacity. We did spend a lot of time, my team and Joel's team, talking with Mr. Stewart and others in the community. And even in my own conversations with Joel and Nate and others on his team, I even took the route myself so that I can understand it and really validate what Joel is about to present. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Joel to go through the presentation. If there are any questions following, certainly here I can answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee and members of the board. I'm Joel Freilich, Director of Service Management. Um, Two questions were raised. Um, I'll deal with them sequentially. One of them really deals with the 48 and 48A and 50. And the fundamental question is that the staff considered prior during the next gen planning process, which was an involved process, during that planning process, pre next gen, we considered the question should all the trips on the 48 line serve Marymount instead of just half. Pre-next gen, half of all the 48 trips split off the main route and ended at South Miles Road, a residential area, instead of Marymount Hospital. And those trips that split off were labeled 48A. It was decided that under next gen, Route 48, all trips should go to Marymount Hospital because doing so would provide very consistent 30-minute service to Marymount Hospital. The reason we recommended in the first round of discussion, which uh, I presented to the board last fall, we recommended, this slide was presented to the board last fall after hearing comments, we recommended maintaining that next gen alignment because we felt that it prioritized access to healthcare and jobs at Marymount Hospital. We felt that was true to what the community told us they wanted for their transit system. Although the stops on the 48A branch were lower ridership, next gen did not cut them off. NextGen gave them a different route to serve all their stops. The different route is numbered the 50. The virtue of the 50 is it has some similarities to the 48A. One of the chief similarities is that it can, the 50 provides to those stops, to that neighborhood, just as the 48A did, it still provided one seat access, no transfer required to University Hospital, Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve, University Circle, and 12 connecting RTA routes, including all rail routes, red, blue, and green, and including the health line. It doesn't get to University Circle via Shaker Square, but if someone is determined to go to Shaker Square, they have two options. One is to transfer where the, where, where the route crosses the 48. Another is to, as Reverend Lucas recommended, just stay on the bus to the East 116th St. Luke Station and ride the rail one bus to sh one stop to Shaker Square. Now those affected stops, formerly 48A, and today labeled 50. Despite their low ridership, 
NextGen actually improved their service. It improved their service from five-day-a-week service to seven-day-a-week service. Prior to NextGen, there was no bus at that stop, at those stops on weekends. So this was presented last fall. Mr. Stewart followed up and came to several sessions, and he said, I've got another way, and he wrote this in emails to the board. I've got another way. You can still have two trips to Marymount Hospital, and this is a somewhat more complex way of doing it, and let me tell you what it is. Under Mr. Stewart's follow-up proposal, the 48 would go back to branching again. The trips to South Miles would be again labeled 48A, and only half the trips or only hourly service would go to Marymount Hospital. However, Mr. Stewart said you could reroute the 50 to also go to Marymount Hospital hourly instead of going to South Miles. And Mr. Stewart points out that a person at Marymount Hospital would still see two trips every hour. But very importantly, and it does make a difference to riders, one of the trips per hour would be a 48 and the other trip per hour would be a 50. We assess this. Two significant downfalls prevented us from implementing this suggestion. The first one under the assessment here is this. We have many riders who ride east-west routes, such as the 14 on Kinsman, the 15 on Harvard, the blue and green line. If we were to implement the more complicated way of serving Marymount, there would be no place for those riders to get off their bus and wait at one stop for half-hourly service to Marymount. Because if they get off at the 48 transfer point, they're only going to get hourly service to Marymount. If they get off at the 50, they'll get hourly service to Marymount. The best place to get off will depend on the exact moment that they're trying to get off the bus. Much more complicated. What riders told us through the next-gen process, the public involvement process, is that Riders need to be able to stand at one place and get at least two trips per hour if possible if it's going to a major destination like Marymount Hospital. That's why you see so many blue lines on next-gen maps, blue lines signifying half-hour service. That's just one drawback. There's another significant drawback of this complicated way of serving Marymount Hospital, and that is there's a large cluster of apartment buildings on Southmoreland, Northmoreland, and Kemper. Under NextGen, they have half-hourly service to Marymount. But under the complicated proposal, they would only have hourly service to Marymount. We did review the ridership numbers yet again and verified that all 48 trips should go to Marymount because anything that goes down the former 48A branch will miss stops on the 48, and the stops that they miss had almost twice as many riders as the stops they serve. So our conclusion from this assessment of the more complicated way of serving Marymount Hospital is that NextGen serves the community better. We'll illustrate this here on a map. I turn your attention to the left side of the screen where you see pictured the NextGen network. In the center upper level of the screen, you'll see a, des a label that says large apartment buildings. That bracketed area of the blue 48 route has large apartment buildings on Kemper, Northmoreland, and Southmoreland. Today, all residents of those buildings have half-hourly service to Marymount Hospital, signified by that firm blue line going all the way down. If you turn yourself to the right side of the screen under the proposal from Mr. Stewart, those large apartment buildings We'll have two gray routes, one 48 and one recreated 48A. But only the 48 trips go to Marymount. Excuse, so me, go excuse me, Joe, just point of clarification. They have half an hour to Marymount, but also to the UCI area? Yes, on, yes. Uh, so let's, um, I will point out that in either case, they have either one works pretty well for taking those residents to university circle. They work about the same. 
but the clear advantage to the residents of those apartment buildings of the next gen on the left is going to Marymount, they have half hourly service, whereas with the proposal on the right, they have only hourly service to Marymount Hospital. There's a, this is the key difference. And the second key difference, you will notice some red east-west lines on the 14 and the 15. Those are very important east-west lines. On the left graph, when you want to get off, if you are a 14 rider or a 15 rider and you want to get off and go to Marymount, you hop off when your bus reaches the 48 route. You get off and you wait and you get half hourly service to Marymount. You'll never have to wait more than a half hour even if for some reason you just missed the bus. But on the right, that won't work. Not as well. Because if you get off where your route crosses the 48 slash 48 a, and you're going to Marymount, and a 48A comes along, you can't get on it. It won't take you there. You have to stay longer, another 30 minutes, to wait for a 48. So that's so for the transferring rider from the prominent east-west routes, which carry a lot of people, the system on the right is significantly less convenient, and for the apartment dwellers, it's also significantly less convenient. And so for this reason, staff is staying with the next-gen structure in this area. We're continuing to keep the 50 on those former 48A stops, and we're going to continue to send all 48 trips to Marymount Hospital. Mr. Stewart brought up a second issue which is Walden Avenue. During the next-gen planning process of 2019 and 2020, RTA carefully reviewed Walden Avenue. The history of Walden Avenue is that more than 20 years ago, nearly all the number 15A trips on Walden, nearly all that service was removed more than 20 years ago because of low and declining ridership. Low and declining ridership is not unusual when a street has nothing but residences, no businesses, no services. Back then, it was decided to just keep a few, and the original proposal was eliminate all the service, but there was a compromise made, and a few rush hour trips on Walden were retained. Some people stepped forward and said, I really could use a few rush hour trips in the morning to go downtown and a few in the afternoon to come back. Now, more than 10 years ago, while keeping that rush hour pretty much as it was, RTA renamed the 15A as 15 via Walden. RTA has not used 15A as a term for 10 years. However, people who stopped writing 10 years ago still use that term. Next Gen came along and looked at those few trips, which had very, very much declining ridership, and decided that those resources would be better used elsewhere in the system. There were only three trips going downtown in the morning, only three trips coming back in the afternoon. We discussed this with the Ward 1 councilman, he asked specifically about the ridership, and as I explained to him before implementation, in the morning, those three trips combined only picked up eight people in this residential area going downtown. And only four of those eight returned in the afternoon rush hour on those trips. Where did the others go? Most likely, when leaving downtown, they took something more convenient and frequent, such as the main 15 on Harvard or even the 14 on Kinsman, because the walk isn't that much different. Why I say the walk isn't much different is that each one of these stops is between 0 0.1 mile and 0 0.6 miles from improved service on number 15, the main line, which we'll talk about, the main line. 
And by the way, if you want to walk less than 0 0.6 miles, as long as you're willing to go to something else like a 14 or a 40, you don't have to even walk 0 0.6 miles. Mr. Stewart followed up. He designed a brand new 15A route, okay? Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the next gen service provides 15 minute service on Harvard at the Lee Harvard Plaza. And that plaza is important. It has dental service, pharmacy, banks, lot, public library, and Dave's Market. It's very important for shopping and jobs, whereas Walden has only residences. Operations recommends retaining the next-gen service just as it is due to consistently decades of low ridership on Walden and need demonstrated by the community through the next-gen public involvement process for frequent service on the number 15. We provide 15-minute service to jobs, education, and health care following the guidance of the community. Mr. Stewart designed his own 15, oh, so his own route, which he named 15A. We did analyze it. It would serve those lightly used stops on residential streets like Walden Avenue. It would also serve other places, including Cleveland State University, Shaker Square, Tri-C East, and Pinecrest. We assessed that. We found that the next gen network already serves all those other places I just mentioned where the Walden Avenue residents would be taken if they got on the bus. The only addition for this route is on Walden. And as I say, the stops via Walden have been proven to have low ridership for decades. Any trip on, that's run on the via Walden alignment misses stops on the main 15 route. In response to a question from the Ward 1 Councilman, we analyzed that and we showed him the results. The stops missed on Harvard and more than three times as many riders as the stops on via Walden, on Walden. And I'm only counting during the periods when both are competing for riders, that rush hour period. If I would compare the whole day, the ratio would be even much more high, arguing for 15 minute service on the 15. Our conclusion, next gen serves the community better than this proposal. Just in the interest of full analysis, I'm showing you here in gray, in the middle of your screen, the route that was designed by Mr. Stewart and named by him to be 15A. In the center of your screen, you see it is running on a portion of Barlett and a portion of Walden, which are both residential. Toward the top left of your screen, you see it is going to Cleveland State University via Shaker Square and other next-gen destinations. And to the right side of your screen, you see that his designed route, which he has written to the board about, would go to Pinecrest via Tri-C East and other next-gen uh, destinations, all served by next-gen. If I am now about to overlay our next-gen network right on top of this map, leaving the gray where it is, and you'll see that except for those residential streets on Barlett and Walden and the connector streets, all the rest of the route is covered up by better service that's operating today. Blue lines operating every 30 minutes, which is better than the hourly that was proposed for the new 15A, and red, signify, red 15 and red 14 showing you the, the very frequent convenience service that our community asked us to implement. The greater Cleveland community through the next gen process stressed, don't spread it too thin, as Mr. Walker explained to the board. Don't spread your service too thin and try to put it on every single street. You will result, the result will be that service is on every street, but convenient service is nowhere to be found. I'll be happy, Ms. Madam Chair, to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. So <clears throat> I know that was a little longer than normal and it was more in depth, but I specifically requested that it go as in depth as necessary just to so that we can have a greater understanding of the work that had been done. So with that, any questions from any committee member or any member of the board? Ms. Moss? This is maybe a little bit uh, more of a general question 
question, Joel. So I know when buses go down residential street, is there any pushback sometimes from the neighborhood from actually having the buses go down the residential streets? Because I just know they snake through Tremont that way. And as lovely as Cheryl's voice is, is if you're having dinner on professor or if you're sleeping early or late, those are things that, that people here adds to the noise of a, na of, of a residential neighborhood. So I'm just wondering if that ever is a pushback. Um, through the chair, I'd like to respond. We do sometimes get that pushback. However, when there is strong ridership and strong community need, we try very hard to resist that because we care very much about our riders. Um, in this case, ridership is very, very low, as, I, as I've pointed out. Um, so we did not get particularly complaints, um, but uh, when we, if ridership were high, I would defend against those complaints. Okay, any other questions from any other member of the board? Comments, committee members? Ms. Birdsong, did you want to chime in, or Mr. Doc Caver? Go ahead, Doc. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I just want to I just want to add that um, as we look at the next gen system, it is uh, our belief that it is a living system, and so we continue to take in input. Uh, we continue to review requests from the community and understand where aggregators in those communities lie, and we'll continue uh, that process of every quarter. I'm oh, sorry. We'll continue that process. I'll just come up there. Is it turning green? The light should be green if it's on. Just hold it, just push it in. So I want to say that we'll continue to listen to the community. We continue to react uh, to those comments. And you know, I, I want to also say that uh, to the chairwoman, just really appreciate your leadership of this committee, because uh, as we looked at these items that we knew would have community impact, one of the things that she did a few years ago was to ensure that uh, in the beginning, we were engaging the community. And so through this, through our fair equity, we have been very involved with the community. Welcome, and we welcome the opportunity to come out to communities to discuss uh, the changes, as well as to hear from those communities about their input into their transit system. Thank you, Theo Burson. Well, well said. Uh, I don't have too much to add other than uh, to echo the appreciation of the board to um, really engage and ask good questions to make sure that we have an equitable system and that we do appreciate our, our riders feedback. Uh, planning is not easy. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to, to skin a cat, so to speak. Um, but we do feel that what we have come up with is, uh, the most, uh, advantageous to our riders. And again, change is not easy. Uh, we don't expect to please everyone, as you mentioned, but to make sure that we do have different options, it does take time to, to get acclimated to a new system. Okay. Um, well, seeing that there are no other comments, um, um, I think we can state that this matter um, has been discussed, it's been deliberated. Um, I think we can, um, I can say I'm satisfied that we've done the due diligence and had the discussions on this. Um, and it's to my satisfaction as I turn over the gavel on my last chairing of this particular committee. Um, and so again, I, I think that we have enough that, it, again, if it comes up, we've done that due diligence. And again, I think the answer is that you'll continue to look at this because, again, RTA looks at its routes, what, twice a year, three times a year, and consistently and ongoing. So with that, um, if there are no other discussion, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn uh, this committee at 1059. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Move second. Thank you. All, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nope. We are adjourned.
And I believe we are turning it over to our chair, our president, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, thank you. And I want to thank you, Dr. McCall, for uh, bringing that report. And Joel, we appreciate the diligence that you have done to show us uh, not only the uh, reason for the good fruit, but you also was able to uh, present the questions that came from uh, Mr. Stewart and show why this was a better group. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Uh, the next uh, committee chair will be, Terry will take over the committee from uh, now on. All right. Uh, hearing now the committee of the whole, we read the roll. President Lucas, Ms. Moss, Here. Mayor Biasiata, Here. Ms. Duarte, Here. Mr. Joyce, Here. Mayor Kumar is not here. Ms. McCall. Here. Ms. Pale. Here. And Mayor Weiss. Here. We have eight board members present. Thank you very much. Today we will be hearing from Don concerning our code book updates. Shirley, how are you today? Good morning, Reverend Lucas. Good, thank you. Uh, Reverend Lucas, Ms. Birdsong, members of the board, I'm Don Tarka. I'm an attorney in the authority's legal department. This morning, we're here to speak about proposed revisions to the OEO policies that are contained in the, uh, RTA's code book. By way of background, the code book was codified in 1989. We are reviewing it and updating it to bring the policies in line with RTA's current operations. And these policies are subject to review and revision every three years. In the area of affirmative action, the Federal Transit Administration requires RTA to have a written plan every four years, and there are guidelines that RTA complies with. The current section 62001 in the code book is basically a recitation of the resolutions that have adopted plans over the years. You can see in your board packet attached to the committee memo for this presentation the exact uh, specific detailed revisions that are being proposed. We're amending section 62001 to clarify what the affirmative action plan is, the fact that FTA requires that plan every four years, the fact that it is presented to the board for adoption prior to submission to FTA, and the fact that progress towards the goals is reported quarterly to the board. In addition, in the area of equal employment opportunity. Again, these sections are all redlined in detail in the board packet. We're proposing to amend section 64201, which deals with equal opportunity affirmative action, 64202, which relates to non-harassment and retaliation, 64203 relates to sexual harassment, and 64204 relates to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Then because in the past there have been some duplicative provisions included in the code, we have an obsolete chapter 636 that deals with sexual harassment. Because the revisions to 64203 are bringing that policy up to date, chapter 636 is obsolete and the recommendation is to repeal it. Staff requests that the Committee of the Whole recommend these provisions to the Board of Trustees for approval. Are there any questions? questions to the attorney? Questions? Anybody? Anybody? If not, will we have a motion to take this to the board. Move adoption. Valerie. Second. Second, Biasiata. Thank you. All those in favor, aye. 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 Oh, no, thank you, and thank you very much, John. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Oh, I'm sorry. We have an executive session has been requested. Uh, to confer with RTA attorney regarding a dispute that is a subject of pending permanent court action to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee or official. We have a motion to go into executive session. So moved, Valerie. Second. Karen, second. All right, all those in favor, aye. Okay. Aye. I believe I have to call oh, the roll, Mr. The Chair. Role. Okay. Thank you. You're correct. President Lucas? Yes. Ms. Moss? Yes. Mayor Biasiata? Yes. Ms. Duarte? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. 
Ms. McCall. Yes. Yes. Ms. Payo. Yes. And Mayor Weiss. Yes. We have eight A's and none opposed. All right. At this time, um, President Lucas, did you want to have the session in here or did you all want to go in the back? It's up to the board. We want to go in the board back or we do it right here? Stay right here. We'll ask everyone else to adjourn it. And come back, uh, we'll call you. But there's no other legislation coming up today. Okay, at this time, uh, only staff that is uh, required to stay to uh, leave the room at this time.
I'm moving. I move to, oh. to come out of executive session. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Let me just drop the time down. All right, uh, President Lucas, Miss Moss, yeah. Mayor Biasiata. Did he have, did he leave? Miss Dorte. Okay, Mr. Joyce, yeah. uh, Ms. McCall, yes. Ms. Payo, yes. okay, and Mayor Weiss. Yes. We have seven A's and none opposed. Uh, nope, that's it. Okay. Got that on the agenda. So moved. Aye. Aye. Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website at www.